Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our public sector catering plant-based week webinar. We're in the middle of a, a very busy week of, of information and sharing, which I'm sure you've seen, and David and, and we'll be sharing and telling you a little bit more about it towards the end, uh, where you can find more information and have a look at what we've been up to. Uh, but today is all about making the transition to more sustainable menus. And we've got a great panel of people joining, David. Um, we'll just wait, give it a couple of minutes, a couple of more seconds for people to log in. We seem to have slowed down, so I'm sure people will drift in over the course of the next, the next few minutes. So, David, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm David Fode, editor of Public Sector Catering magazine, um, and thank you for joining us for our plant-based week 2023 webinar. Um, the theme, as Andrew said, is making the transition to a more sustainable menu. And what do we mean by that? Um, we know that caterers now routinely offer menus that uh, have plant-based options on them. Meat-free Mondays, for example, is become fairly common in schools. Um, hospital menus have definitely turned a bit greener than they were a few years ago. And if you think about the, um, the the Gen Z interest in um, health and the environment, then universities uh, have a fairly easy job of it. They're probably pushing it a bit of an open door. But is that enough? Um, dietary advice is still that we need to be eating more fruit and vegetables. And it's clear that the food choices that we make have a role to play in achieving net zero goals because a more plant-based diet is generally regarded as more sustainable. So then what should public sector caterers be doing about it? Well, that's why we've got our panel of experts here today to offer some insight into these issues and more. So let's meet them. And there, there they are all coming online as if on cue. Um, Richard. Yeah, we've got Richard McIlwain, Chief Executive of the Vegetarian Society, whose organisation is currently in the middle of its own National Vegetarian Week. So good afternoon, Richard. Hi, David. How are you doing? Oh, fine, thank you. Uh, we've also got uh, Musa Haddad, um, Vegetarian for Life's uh, Head of Research and Policy. Hello, Musa. Um, we, um, you are muted at the moment, Musa. Hi, sorry about that. That's OK. Uh, we have Tony Mulgrew, the pioneering chef at award winning Ravens Cliff School. Hi, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, David. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And um, we've got uh, Claire Ogley, head of campaigns and research with the Vegan Society, who's also here. Hello. Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. And we've got Colette Fox, who heads ProVeg UK's School Plates programme. Thank you for joining us, Colette. Thanks for having me, too. OK. Um, I'm going to let them in to introduce themselves and offer a few initial thoughts about the work they do and trends in plant-based food. Um, after that, we plan to tackle a few of the practical issues that caterers face and uh, how that affects their ability to expand their plant-based options on their menus. Um, we are then hoping to be able to take some questions from you. Um, you can post one at any time, just use the Q&A function um, please include your name and company if you can. Um, if you just want to comment as the uh, <coughs> webinar progresses, then get involved using the chat function, remembering to use the option to all panellists and attendees. Um, so, Richard, over to you to get us underway, please. Yeah, cool. Thanks, David. So, yeah, I'm uh, delighted to, to be here. I lead the Vegetarian Society with the world's oldest campaigning vegetarian uh, organization um we campaign on the on behalf of vegetarians and vegans but i think increasingly i'm sure like most people interested in the 90 percent of people who are still in some form eating meat for all those reasons that you articulated in your intro david you know we 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 have a climate crisis we have a biodiversity crisis we have a health crisis and um i think most people were here would agree that certainly plant based or plant forward uh, meals are, are one way that we can push back across all three of those um uh, issues which sort of intersect um it's also national vegetarian week so it's our it's our annual big showpiece campaign We've got thousands of people signing up around the country uh delighted that we could 
joining forces with public education's plant-based week as well, which is just happened to be running at the same time. So it made perfect sense um, to, to join up and sort of cross-promote um, our messages. You know, as well as a campaigning organisation works on policy and so on, we also operate our own cookery school. So we have a, a, a team of chefs um, headed up by the wonderful Sam Platt. Um, and we're not just about teaching members of the public to cook. We also um, work with professional chefs. We work with the NHS last year and local authorities and schools um, to not just introduce the concepts of vegetarian and plant-based eating, but to actually teach the skills involved, particularly at a catering level when you're, you're cooking for tens or hundreds um, of people. And in terms of trends, well, you know, nobody can have ignored the rise of the plant-based aisle in the supermarket, you know, um, bit by bit, it's becoming more normal. You don't have to visit your health food store anymore to get great plant-based meals. But from a public sector point of view, I don't know if you saw the announcement, I think it was today, Compass Group looking to decarbonise across their range, 180 million meals. Um, and I think increasingly, the, the idea of low carbon food, which intersects brilliantly with plant based and some of the, the, the sort of um, lower fat vegetarian foods is, is one intersection that I think we can really we can really leap on. Um, so, you know, National Vegetarian Week is deliberately themed on a, on a climate change uh, message. We're working with a whole host of local authorities around the country and other um, uh, public sector bodies, including businesses. Because I think, to a certain extent, whilst you know I'm a huge advocate for animal ethics, I think climate is one thing we can agree on that we we need to do something about. And while most people may feel powerless in terms of not being able to choose what their who their energy provider is or what car they drive, you can choose to change the food you eat. And I think the public sector has a whole role, a huge role to play in that. And I've probably said enough there, so I'll I'll move on. That's that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Musa, can I come to you next? Yep, sure. Um, and I've unmuted myself this time. Um, so we are the, uh, so I work for Vegetarian for Life. We've been around in one form or another since the 60s. And we are the UK's charity for older vegans and vegetarians. Um, we particularly focus on the UK care sector. Um, and we actually, we, we do, we have a range of services that are targeted at that sector. Um, and we've grown to the extent that we have around 1600 care establishments as members, which is around the sixth of the UK care sector. So, for example, we kind of um, we offer bespoke caterer training to help kind of um, make practical for care establishments, the things we're talking about. I think we we come from a sort of maybe a, a particular perspective, which is that we are about kind of protecting the rights of older vegans and vegetarians to have their deeply held beliefs respected and you know that's obviously kind of manifest mostly through diet and the food they eat so we're kind of fairly agnostic as to the reasons for that diet but it's clear that if we want to encourage care establishments to take more seriously the 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 kind of needs the deep the deeply held needs of their um, vegan and vegetarian residents then we need to kind of work we, we we do better if we work with the grain of the um things that they're doing already so clearly they have sustainability targets and goals and um I mean as Richard said switching to a plant-based diet is one very kind of straightforward way of helping to achieve those goals so you know if we can kind of marry up with that agenda even though our kind of starting point is slightly different it's about the kind of rights and dignity of of um, particular residents, you know, I think that's really, really helpful for us. So um, one of the things we're doing this autumn is we're producing a sustainability guide for the UK care sector, which is going to kind of help them to understand how to cater better for vegans and vegetarians, but also to kind of um, look at the, the kind of carbon metrics associated with particular recipes so that they can kind of really understand the extent to which these shifts will will help kind of them meet their sustainability goals but actually it will also help them to become more accustomed to catering in a way that suits the people that we represent um in terms of kind of evidence and trends i think it's fair to say that veganism is kind of seen as a more of a young person's thing i mean the the growth has been 
kind of you know eye watering in the last decade or so but actually um what we see is there's significant growth in the older population as well so we do a survey every five years a representative survey of the uk care sector the next one's due next year and in the most recent one we found a 167 percent increase in the number of vegan care residents and um i would anticipate that that's either going to continue or accelerate in the next next time round. Um, and there are kind of a few little tidbits of information the british social attitude survey found that older people were actually twice as likely to have reduced their meat consumption as younger people um so there's actually you know within within the kind of the the idea of plant-based there's more of a there's gradation so there's reduction obviously there's and then there's kind of commitment to a particular diet so i think um you know we we are looking for more evidence on this so we're in the process of commissioning some work kind of modeling future trends and in uh, vegan and vegetarians vegans and vegetarians within care settings so hopefully we'll know more soon but at the moment um you know one of the things we are trying to kind of educate the care sector on is that even if they may not have so many guests at the moment who are vegan or vegetarian that number is likely to grow in the future and i think the more we can talk in terms of other agendas that plant-based food hit then the more we can kind of achieve change so that's kind of where we fit into this debate i think okay thank you very much of the um four organizations we've got represented here today i believe you all run um training programs um for chefs and and the general public as well um but uh tony you are a caterer who's just gone out there and and done it yourself anyway so um give us some of your initial thoughts uh, good afternoon everyone uh with with myself being in catering for more years than i'd like to remember uh i went came into uh, education catering uh in 2001 so there was lots of changing starting to happen uh by 2008 certainly up in Yorkshire in the uh, Calderdale area, uh, the local authority catering provider uh, was dwindling from being providing all the schools in Calderdale to more and more schools going in-house. And uh, with me being one of the first in-house caterers, it was left to my own devices really to introduce any new concepts. So I was in a mainstream uh, secondary school at the time with uh, 850 students and one hot plate and 45 minutes to produce <laughs> the meals for all those students. So the uh, first thing was how do we get all these students through the hot plate as quickly as possible and give them a meal that they're going to appreciate and perhaps encourage looking at different options of food that we were offering. So uh, it was important to me to straight away split that hot plate up into different areas. So we uh, put on salad bars, jacket potato bars, pasta bars, um, what, what we called uh, the five uh, pick and mix. So it was uh, sandwiches with snacks and what have you that, that people could grab and go. And the first thing that I noticed was uh, students will quickly adapt if you put things that they see on the high street that looks familiar. So being able to introduce uh, nowadays is quite uh, common, uh, pasta pots. Now we were making all our own fresh tomato sauces and uh, adding our own other vegetarian options or meat options. The same with paninis. Uh, we got the students to write recipes. So one of the most popular uh, paninis was uh, uh, pesto with roasted peppers and cheese. So things like that worked really well. Uh, 12 years down the line, uh, incredible edible Todmonden, great success, growing 
uh, cooking at a local community level, business level, and education level. Great success, uh, went global. And then I was asked to move to uh, where I am now, Ravenscliff High School, uh, SEN School, uh, which meant starting all over again because they were going from local authority to in-house. And uh, having such a array of uh, allergen diets uh, intolerances at this present moment. I think we've got about 41 special diets. So we're looking at uh, gluten-free, maize-free, uh, you name it, everything's free with these diets. So it isn't as easy for me as a caterer to go to my suppliers and say, can I have a vegetarian or vegan option that would suit our students. And this is why you'll see that I produce recipes with other chefs uh, that have been involved in with best practice at a, a global level that basically are vegetables. And we produce everything as fresh as possible. So uh, we know exactly what's going into those recipes so that we can offer them on the hot plate to our students as the main option, but it covers all our allergen uh, students as well. So it okay. makes life a little bit easier for ourselves. Mm. And then, of course, uh, like most schools nowadays with the meat-free uh, we, we've been working with the Vegetarian Society in the past where um, most of our menu is 82% uh, meat-free. Uh, we've always carried that out, uh, meat-free Mondays. Uh, we always offer a vegetarian or vegan choice as the first option on the hot plate. And the fact that we're offering so many vegetarian vegan options it gives us the option yet again to uh, think about the supply and sourcing of quality meat for those days that we offer meat. And uh, so far, it seems to work like anything in schools. You have to basically carry on and keep persuading students to take uh, better, healthier options. Mm. Uh, we always offer two uh, vegetables with whatever meal we're offering. Uh, we get as much of our fresh produce from the school polytunnel that the students grow themselves. So that connection between uh, where food comes from and bringing it to the kitchen for it to be cooked and seeing it on the hot plate uh, it actually resonates throughout the school that every student knows at some point throughout the curriculum they will we'll be planting uh, seeds to grow and uh, um, sell in their little en enterprises mm. but any excess is coming into the kitchen I'm cooking with it and they can see that so uh, yeah. sounds, sounds like you've developed a little bit of a, a winning formula there Tony and that, it, it's very interesting to hear I wouldn't say a winning formula because we're always having to look at other ways. And that's the thing about school food. You cannot have this tunnel vision. You have to be flexible yeah. and be able to change mm. and to be able to follow the trends, whether it be vegetarian or vegan, and give those choices and those options. Yeah, OK, I understand. Um, Claire, could we uh, come, come to you now? Yes, thanks, David. Um, I just want to say this is a great conversation to be having um, at this point and very timely with, um, I'm sure everyone will have seen the news today that the world will likely breach the 1.3 um, degrees warming target. Um, so I think it's just important now to have a conversation about how catering can, can play into that and how food is a really large part of our um the areas where we can reduce our environmental impact. Um, so yeah, I'm Claire Oakley. I'm the head of campaigns, policy and research at the Vegan Society. Um, so we help people go vegan and stay vegan. Um, and we do that through 
big uh, public facing behavior change campaigns um, and then also through targeting policymakers and trying to change policy on a kind of structural systemic level as well. Um, so one of our big campaigns is called Catering for Everyone um, and it's aimed at the public sector um, with a call for at least one vegan option on every menu, public sector menu as standard. Um, so that's our big, our big ask with it. Obviously, a lot of people are going much further than that, um, but we're aiming to have that for, from a vegan perspective. Uh, and we'll be doing a lot of work engaging with councils um, later this year to kind of push that message um, and improve options for vegans. Um, our in-house dietitians have also done quite a lot of work with um, the prisons catering services to improve vegan menus there. Um, so we've got kind of a lot of practical experience on creating vegan menus on a very tight budget in that area as well. Um, so it's something we're really aware of. Um, in terms of your question about trends, um, I would also pick up that point earlier that we're seeing a real demographic shift. Um, so it's not just a trend, it's a kind of overall, overall shift. Um, our research has shown that people under 35 are, are, I think it's about six times more likely to be vegan than those over 65. And with that trend increasing, it's going to consolidate. That's what we're seeing. So we're going to end up with much more demand. Um, and I'd also make the point that it's not just vegans and vegetarians. I think consistently about 30% of people tell us that they are trying to reduce, actively trying to reduce their meat consumption. So there's that market or that that kind of demand there as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. And uh, Khaled? Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Paulette Fox. Um, I head up ProVeg UK's School Plates programme. Um, we're probably the newest kids on the block in this group. We've been running our programme for just five years. Um, I'm a plant-based nutritionist and extremely passionate about children's health and planetary health. So just so you have a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, so, so the School Plates programme, we're essentially a team of nutritionists and chefs, and we review menus of all schools. Um, we create plant-based recipes. We do that in collaboration with school caterers so that we're providing them with what they want and what's popular and what they need, how they can turn their popular dishes into plant-based versions. Um, we also run online and in-person plant-based um, training for caterers. Um, so we yeah, have those every month, the online sessions, and we go out and train really to just inspire um, school caterers about plant-based food, why it's so important, um, that it, you know, address all of their concerns, because often there are lots of concerns that it will be um, not very tasty, it will be expensive, it won't give children the nutrients they need. So we kind of start off by listening to all their concerns and then work with them through our sessions to really gently get them on board and inspire them by getting them cooking the, the food and eating it at lunchtime and then having another discussion about what do they think about it all now. So um, we've also launched our School Plates Awards at the beginning of this year, which essentially is putting our 23 evidence-based actions into a checklist. And that is going absolutely through the roof. Um, we have, I think, had seven bronze awards so far, two silvers and about to announce our first golds, which is better than we expected to get even by the end of this year. Um, so it's just really, you know, a huge incentive to drive those little nudges forward, whatever that is, whether it's tweaking the language, tweaking the recipes, the positioning of dishes or menus, all of these evidence based actions. Um, and in terms of trends, I mean, hopefully this isn't a trend this is this is just going one way now from what i can see um as claire said you know we're we're not on target to hit these um you know global warming um measures that have been set um i can just speak from my experience with school caterers i joined proveg just over 2 years ago and we had just over 10 uh, multi academy trusts and councils local authorities that we were supporting that's now over 80 in two years, um, we were very much going to them, asking them, can we help you? Can we help you reduce your emissions, get your school food healthier? And it's completely flipped. And I can just see in the short time I've been doing this, the pace accelerating and more and more every day we're being approached. Can you help us? So there is just a huge demand to, to do this. Councils, all school caterers, private caterers, individual schools know this is what they need to do. Um, and they just need a bit of help to, 
get started. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I, w I wanted to first of all pick up um, Claire on, on the point that you made about the um, the, the, the sort of the global warming um, scenario, which obviously isn't looking good. Many um, organisations and companies in this uh, country will have net zero um, goals and targets, as well as an overall uh, government one. And I wonder just how much leverage they um, provide, do you think, uh, in helping caterers to look at more sustainable, probably plant-based menus? Do you mean the um, uh, sort of public sector targets? Yeah, I mean, uh, NHS has uh, an overall mm -hmm. target and, and trusts within the NHS will have their own you know, particular ones if, if they are ahead of the curve, so to speak. But um, do, do, do they provide any sort of um, leverage that caterers can use uh, in, in terms of, you know, perhaps forcing the pace of change in, in the menus that they provide? Yeah, absolutely. I think targets are completely essential um, in terms of to drive that type of growth. Um, and I think it's something that is difficult without a kind of set target to know exactly what how to reduce by and, and mm. what to reduce. Um, so I think they're essential. And I think it's a real shame that the um, government hasn't gone for a national target on meat reduction. Um, we saw in the in the national food strategy that a 30 percent target was recommended um for kind of meat reduction and the government has not tried to do that um i think it would be a lot more helpful if we had a kind of top-down target to go for um but i think it's great that we're seeing increasing um councils trying to do that themselves or more kind of grassroots movement to do so um and i think when you look at that 30 percent target it gives you a nice kind of clear third um third goal to aim for that you'll get you're trying to kind of reduce every kind of third meat-based meal to a plant-based protein one so yeah I think it would be really helpful for more places to take that up and to try and do it themselves. Okay thank you. Um, Richard your um, campaign this year for around National Vegetarian Week is very much focused on a sort of the environmental impact of things isn't it? It is, yeah, and, and you know as part of the campaign we, we are putting out a national call for carbon labelling on food packaging and on restaurant menus you know we've all got very used to seeing calorie information on menus that you know are employed 250 FTs or more um and I think for many people that's helpful um you know giving people information allowing people to make um sustainable choices is good it's only one part of it there's never any silver bullet to this and as Claire says we do need some targets we're, we're badly missing direction from the top when it when it comes to government um, and, you know, most governments will fight shy of introducing short term targets because they're just hostages to fortune mm. you know, uh, and the political winds blow blow the wrong way and, and you miss them. But when you've got, you know, the government's own food advisors like Henry Dimbleby suggesting we need to cut uh, uh, meat consumption by 30 percent. So we're not talking about CO2. We're talking about direct. How much meat do we eat? You've got their, their own climate change committee suggesting between 20 and 50 percent over the next decade and through to 2050. Um, all of their advisors are just saying one thing, we need to eat less meat. And I think the public sector can take some um, comfort from that, actually, that ultimately, you know, that it has to be a direction of travel. Um, and Dimbleby himself says, you know, if you if you have a couple of meat free days a week on your catering menus, you're sort of getting you're sort of at that 30 percent reduction anyway. Um, so I think that's that's where we'd very much like to see the whole of the public sector, not just schools, universities, hospitals, mm. prison service, particularly those areas that obviously were people are dependent on meals three times a day and aren't just dipping in and out, as you might with with, uh, with hospitals, particularly in schools where, you know, uh, reports suggest that 50 percent of of nutrition for some school children comes from the school meal they have in the day. Um, and so if we're going to introduce more plant forward policies, um, we've got to make sure that it, this is not just about increasing the quantity of plant provision, it's increasing the quality of plant based provision at the same time. And that's something we're very focused on. OK, thank you. Uh, Tony, perhaps if I, I can bring you in on, on this point. Um, does your school have um, any sort of uh, policy in terms of um, uh, trying to achieve net zero or decarbonize and are the sort of the menus that you're producing seen as part of that strategy if they do 
the school itself uh, is always trying to yeah, do better things to decarbonize and net zero. Where the menus are concerned, because we're such a small team, there's myself and uh, uh, a team of four, uh, I'm doing all the uh, buying and purchasing and procurement of everything myself. So it's important to me that uh, A, I've got really good local suppliers that I can trust. And uh, this means, yes, I have to put more hours in to make sure that I'm getting the correct uh, uh, items that I want. And it's important to me that I'm buying as much local and British as I possibly can. Uh, yes, we are privileged where our food costs are perhaps higher than the average school. So uh, uh, that's an ongoing uh, challenge to convince uh, my boss and uh, the school governors that this is uh, good value for money because at the end of the day, what we are putting on the hot plate is sustaining our students and giving them the energy to focus on the education that they need to be learning. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I say, I focus on net zero and uh, carbon, possibly, but with being such a small team, uh, it's difficult you know, to be able to uh, monitor exactly where things uh, would meet those levels. So, uh, as I say, it's important that I have really good local suppliers, knowing that I'm buying fresh and uh, British and supporting the, the local economy. Yeah, I, I, I know, um, Tony, one of the things that um, gets talked about when people are discussing, uh, you know, calculating the, the, the carbon um, footprint of, of, of a food and, and a menu is that actually sustain, um, buying uh, locally um, supports the local economy and that there is a sort of a social value um, benefit to that that's sort of part of the whole sustainability equation. I, I'd certainly like to think so because, you know, for this last 20 years, I've been passionate about supporting local British farmers uh, and knowing that I can get my organic veg from Tadcaster, uh, which is like 30 mile away from where I'm stopping. Uh, if I use my local wholesale uh, fruit and veg butcher, which is two mile down in the village, sorry, not even two mile, uh, five minute drive. And, uh, knowing that I've got uh, fresh halloumi and uh, other cheeses in the village. Uh, my eggs come from a mile away. So having all these local suppliers, producers is great for us as a school. Not every school can do this. And that's mainly down to uh, the cost effectiveness of how much money is being put into the school food costs. And as I said, we are quite privileged that ours is quite high. And uh, uh, I, I always am very aware when I'm uh, buying and procuring new produce, what effect that might have on my budget. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Colette, if, if I can just sort of change tack slightly and, and come to you. Um, you, you are involved, involved in the um, school plates um, program, aren't you? And we know that um, schools have um, fairly uh, tight school food standards. So how does putting more um, plant-based options onto school menus work in terms of um, managing to meet those nutrition standards? Um, is it more difficult or is it easier? Well, it's a good, really good question. Um, basically, there's still a lot that um, schools can do within the, let's take the English school food standards. Um, um, they can have two 
uh, meat free days. They've got to, they've got to serve meat at least three days a week and dairy every day, as we know. So they they can um, have those two meat free days, and they could potentially have um, a plant based option every day. So this is what we encourage any school that we're working with to do. We've just got our first big council who's moved to two meat free days. We have a, a school that's moved to two plant based days. So that, that that shift is happening, but that's pushing the standards to the limit. Um, the school, in our experience, schools and school caterers want to go further and they're coming to us saying, what are we allowed to do? Um, so we then in turn go to the DfE and say, what are they allowed to do? Can they do this? Are they allowed to not do this? So I think it's the, the standards are quite ambiguous um, and they're not really um, in line with the evidence out there from things like, you know, the Climate Change Committee, the National Food Strategy, the IPCC reports everything is all kind of telling us the same thing and I feel like the standards were set before we had a lot of this new information um, it, from my perspective it's definitely holding back school caterers they want to do more and I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see um, uh, you know an acceleration of school caterers not sticking to those standards because they they feel that they're you know out of date um, and we should have a bit more guidance from above so yeah, it, there, there's still lots that can be done, but definitely they're, they're restrictive. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, I, I take your point. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, no Musa, if I could uh, bring you in now um, with your sort of insight into the, the care sector, um, you are, as, as part of your programme, you, you help to train uh, chefs so that they can deliver the, the vegan and vegetarian options that uh, you um, believe so passionately are, are are important to people in in care settings um how do you go about um making sure that that they are achieve uh, getting the nutrition they need because uh sometimes people uh the the elderly and, and vulnerable in, in care settings um can be at risk of malnourishment can't they yeah and it's um it's quite a complex thing really i guess there are you know there are quite a lot of dimensions even to that sort of simple question so i guess you know the starting point again is kind of this idea of autonomy um people have kind of lived people in care settings have lived you know the, the bulk of their life now that they're, they're kind of you know they're, they're kind of in the the last phase of life i guess um so they kind of know what they like they know what they want to eat they know what they believe in so i think it's really important to try and work with the grain of that um so you know listen to to what people want and i i am um, i spoke to kind of one of the catering managers in, a, in one of the big care chains and he, he kind of put it that one of the thing one of the the big warning signals for a person's health when they kind of enter this last phase of life is if they start to lose weight and one of the best ways to stop someone losing weight is to give them food they want to eat and that's actually quite it sounds believe and and almost banal but actually a lot of the a lot of people um it's something like 70% of people in care homes have got some form of dementia. So they might actually not be in a position to always communicate their preferences. They might need, so one of the things we work on is we, we use something called talking mats, which is a way of kind of getting into people's deep preferences. So you need to kind of tune into that. And one, and a way of, another way of doing that is to have advocates to people to give a statement of wishes. So we know what they want to eat. And that's a really important part. Um, and that's kind of, that's not the, that's not the chefs going in and doing that, but that's a big part of how we educate. The care sector um but then sometimes people do need that bit of extra so they need fortification in their meals and we've actually kind of produced guidance for the care sector on plant-based fortification because there's a sort of um there's a way of doing things that typically involves using whey sorry terrible pun but like <laughs> um to kind of um fortify with dairy but actually you can do it in a plant-based way. It's just, it needs a little bit of education. And so we've, we've got guidance on that, but when our chefs go in and train, they also kind of talk about that. And then um, we, we focus a lot on simple swaps. So things that are not too, comp you're not asking the, the care establishment to kind of change 10 things all at once. You're saying within, you know what you cook, you, you do it in a certain way. These are a few tweaks you can make that will actually kind of give people what they want, nutrition they need. But you've got to kind of balance that with, um with respect to what people want as well because they kind of you know you've, you hold their their beliefs and their their life in your hands a little bit when you're catering for them around the clock 
So it's important to kind of ensure that their their autonomy is respected as well. So it's kind of quite a complex thing, really. Yeah, sure. OK, um, I wanted uh, now to pick up on a, a question that's coming from um, someone who, who's watching. Um, they say that the meat free Mondays that they do at their schools. There's getting they're getting some pushback from um, parents um, on the basis that um, it is in in some cases the sort of main meal of the day, and so there's this feeling that it should um, include meat. So um, Claire, perhaps I, I can bring you in on that one first of all. Sure. Yeah. Um, to that, I would say that I think we, in general, the kind of sector suffers from the idea that plant-based and and vegetarian and vegan kind of alternatives are always inferior or that it's less lesser than and I think we need to move to a point where not having meat isn't review uh, regarded as missing out in any way um, and I think that's a kind of that's a perceptions job but it, I think it's also we need to make sure that the, the food that we're creating is always kind of delicious and appealing um, and people want to eat it and it isn't seen as a kind of lesser than option um, so I'd say it is a tricky one and I think cost and people's circumstances we have to take into account and we know it is difficult for people and it's difficult for caterers at the moment as well um but i think we really need to make always make sure that options are, are something people want to choose and are, are look delicious and are appealing um, and that's something that we're, we're calling for with our campaign as well catering for everyone we don't just want an option we want it to be absolutely appealing and nutritious um and something people want to eat and want to choose and preferably more than one option so they they can choose and they can make a choice there yeah. um so that's yeah that's what i'd say on that one so you what, what you're trying to do is present it not as an alternative but as yeah you know a, this is good a valid in its choice own, own <laughs> yeah right. a great yeah, choice yeah. in its own right mm, sure okay R richard do you have any thoughts on 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 that point this this idea that um you know a if it's to be a sort of solid nutritious meal and it, and it's obviously a view that you know a number of people will have for better or, or worse reasons um and and they and they feel it, it has to contain meat or it's not you know a, the the full meal so to speak well uh, we talked about you know a, a younger generation gen z millennials coming through you now having a, a very different view to parents now i think there's a huge education piece to do with i mean this is clear just within a school setting not the wider public state but there's a there's a big piece for for a school i would say to do um in informing the parents maybe not educating the parents but for mm. you know you look at what happened with jamie oliver a few years ago when he tried to institute healthy foods into schools and you have parents queuing up to push chips and pies because they were worried the children weren't getting the nutrition they need so i think there's there's a there, there's a piece to do with this with the school children but a piece with the the um the parents as well i, I love the story about the school in bonalto where they had decided to institute plant-based lunches and when the parents found out they were up in arms, well, they didn't realise that the the lunches had been in place for a year. <laughs> yeah, the children hadn't raised any concerns. So, you know, I I I, I think what we've got to get across is that a meal isn't missing anything because it's not got meat. And and we, you know, the the, the, the recipes that Tony alluded to earlier that he developed for the Vegetarian Society are a perfect example of, you know, three terms worth of recipes which are they look great um they, they look like something children would want to eat but the nutritional value is high as well and I think that's something else to get across to, to parents that if you're replacing meat particularly with pulses and lentils and beans which can be grown very well in this country coming on for the sort of supporting UK farmers you know if you can show parents that the protein content is just as good as the meat it's replacing and there's a whole variety of other nutrients and micronutrients in there then it's half the battle. I think there will be some, you know, we've got to remember meat is so cultural in this country, isn't it? People of a certain generation have grown up eating it and, and they don't understand. It's not to judge people. They just don't understand if you take meat away, you know, they still have the, these these myths of the pasty grey vegan walking around with no energy. And, you know, the, the fellow speakers on this call will know that's a complete myth, but it still prevails. And so I don't think we should judge anybody, but um i do think providing great information great food photography make the meals look fantastic give parents the nutrition information um is is a big part of the battle that we need to overcome mm -hmm. and that's actually not just in schools that's across nhs universities and and, and you know the, the wider public sector 
Yeah, I, I guess so, social media possibly has a, a part to play here. And, and Tony, I know that uh, you are particularly active on social media and you, you do a lot with um, photographing the dishes and that. Do you find that helps um, get parents on board? I certainly do. Uh, over the years, we developed our own uh, Facebook page and that was mainly, I was <laughs> tired of parents contact me saying, my son, my daughter uh, says there's nothing for them to eat on the hot plate. So I put a Facebook page just for catering uh, in the school. And we photograph every meal that we do. And yes, we do change our menus on a regular basis. Uh, so we may change our menus every six to eight weeks. And, every, and those are a three week cycle menu and we photograph everything every Friday evening when most people are sitting down and relaxing. I'm at home uploading those photographs into the Facebook page and we may have accidents happen in the kitchen where someone spills something. That photograph will go on there as well <laughs> as a bit of fun. But the parents can actually see what is on the hot plate on a daily basis so that they know that when uh, their child comes home and says, oh, there was nothing to eat on the hot plate, they can see what was on that day. Uh, and because we are so proactive with that and also my own Twitter page, uh, it's sharing what we believe is best practice, uh, supporting others with perhaps some ideas around uh, vegetarian or vegan recipes and uh, allowing to see people, uh, people to see that uh, vegetarian choices and vegan choices can be appetizing, uh, exciting, nutritious. And if you work really hard, you can get it in at a sensible price. Right, thank you very much. Um, Colette, now, you mentioned uh, in your introduction about the um, ProVeg Pro introducing its uh, sort of new awards accreditation scheme, if you like, which I, I guess sort of ties in a little bit with the, the whole idea of sort of um, promoting um, more plant based um, options on menus. Um, how, how important do you feel that that is alongside things like, um, you know, using uh, Facebook and various other parts of social media? Yeah, I think it's hugely important. It was something that's kind of evolved with our programme as we were working with councils and other school caterers and they were asking, can we put your logo on our menus as a kind of seal of approval that this is a healthy and sustainable menu? Um, so we looked to create this really and just make it something that's simple for caterers to follow. So um, the response has been really overwhelming. It's a massive driver to get people to change. Um, I would say we, we have kind of, um, there's 23 actions, there's six actions to get to bronze, most of which are behavioral nudges. It's things about changing the positioning and the language and that kind of thing, using symbols instead of saying vegan or vegetarian. Um, and probably typically a, a school caterer might do two or three of those things and then, you know, wait till they have another menu come out six months later and they'll perhaps change a few more. But now we're seeing all six things being done and they're ready and they send the menus back to be rescored and check our feedback again because they want to get the the award on the menu and it's free and they don't really have to do anything they just send it in and we do it for them straight away so it's a you know it's just an incentive it's a way to say thank you for trying to take some positive steps whatever they are they don't need to be towards a bronze they can be any of the the actions that we suggest whatever anyone's able to do so I feel like we need to have these little um, rewards for you know positive behavior as it were it's all anything we can do is is good so um, yeah it's it's really working very well for us so I would encourage anyone out there who wants to get involved do get in touch um, and send us your menus and we'll have a look and give you some feedback Lovely, thank you. Um, Musa, perhaps I can um, get, get you to give us a little bit of a perspective from the, the, the care sector, because obviously 
social media, I would imagine, is sort of less important. So how do you go about <clears throat> reassuring um, the uh, relatives of um, pe people in care homes that not, not only are they um, getting the meals that they want, but they are getting the nutrition they need? Yeah, so I guess um, it's almost the other way around that, um, you know, the 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 rel where the relatives are kind of engaged, they're really supportive of the the diets that they're that they're kind of, um, you know, typically their parents say are following, um, and it's more the concern is it being respected by by the care okay. home and they, um, you know, I mean, one we are so, but in terms of um, you know, are they are they is it nutrition adequate? Um, that much more often boils down to the this idea that they're ref the the older person you typically with dementia is, is refusing food and actually when you kind of get to the bottom of that it's often because they are being fed offered food that they don't actually want to eat but it's kind of the communication within the care setting is quite quite difficult um so you know i think the road to to sort of reassurance tends to lead through listening to the actual beliefs and desires of the care home resident rather than kind of um you know for there's, there is that place for fortification it's really important but um it's typically about making sure that they have what they want to eat okay thank you very much now the, there was a question that um came up um and it was someone who was particularly interested to get some um insight on uh feeding patients in in hospitals um Richard, I, I, I noticed you were sort of re responding to that. What, what, what were the concerns and, and, and what were you able to, to tell them? Um, the, there was uh, a question around um, provision in uh, hospitals. And what I was um, sort of responding on is that, you know, the hospital estate is is a, is a complex area clearly because you're you're managing people with with a wide variety of needs and so i think from the top you would you would always say it's the clinician's view on what any particular patient needs but from a broad spectrum point of view when you're designing um menus either for the you know the, the staff canteen and the public canteens on the nhs estate or broad menus for patients who aren't on specific restricted diets there's a huge um, opportunity to inc to increase the amount of plant-based food. You know, you you need to look at things like um, if you're using sort of alt meats, obviously you know, the fat, salt, sugar. Make sure that you're you're hitting dietary guidelines around that. But I think increasingly, we have talked about it before: pulses, beans, peas, lentils. You know, great foods that you can introduce that have the the bite and the texture. Uh, of meat can be can be brought into very familiar dishes like cottage pie or a chili or a stew um and actually you know from a health and nutritional profile are fantastic um and that's really where we're sort of you know leaning into with our with our hospital-based training you know the school team um can can offer training across any of the, the public sector states but we we worked with two particular nhs trusts just recently halton and preston um went out on site to train their catering staff for the full day um they there's a suite of recipes that they're then left with afterwards to develop themselves these are based on catering portions so i would say for anybody who's who's concerned around you know how you go about expanding plant-based choice in the in the nhs uh, across all of the different food outlets there's definitely um support that we can offer um in terms of coaching nutrition advice on-site training and also as i say a, a suite of recipes as a leave behind so if the information's there it's just a case of um reaching out and and sort of making that first contact okay thank you very much uh, claire uh, uh, another question that came up and um it was uh, one of the most important factors when catering with um alternative proteins and and, and they sort of were, were saying is it is it cost is it nutrition um food safety or the sustainability of, of, of those sorts of, sorts of ingredients uh, that's a great question um and i think yeah all of those have probably have to be taken to into account to a certain extent um in anything but i would probably say with alternative proteins 
generally speaking, they will be more sustainable than meats. So I think with that, you know, you kind of already hit that target um, because as as we've just been saying, you know, things like chickpeas, beans, lentils, peas all kind of have great both health and then sustainability benefits. So to a certain extent, if you're replacing with with those type of um, replacements, then you are going to be getting those things already. So then it kind of comes to cost um, and taste, I would say, um, because especially at this point in time the cost of living with the cost of living crisis that has got to be one of the foremost considerations for everyone I suppose um so that that will and I, I think especially in the in these settings with the public sector not having you know lots and lots of funding or, or lots and lots of budget it's going to be a really key thing to think about so that I'd probably say that one and then um taste because like I said before if we aren't making it an appealing option people aren't going to choose it um so that yeah, I would say above probably possibly above everything else has got to be the thing we focus on. Um, we have to we have to make sure that all the options we're giving people that are plant based are delicious and appealing, um, as well as nutritious. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, uh, Colette. Uh, on the sort of school plates program, when you're talking to school chefs, um, are you able to sort of reassure them that they can reproduce the sort of dishes that you're talking about at a reasonable cost? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the big kind of considerations when we create recipes. We're mindful of um, availability of ingredients and, uh, you know, that we're trying to use as many kind of whole foods, not processed as as possible. Um, and that it has to be easy. And, and as Claire has said, it, it's got to taste good. This is basically about making delicious food and it happens to be plant based food. Um, yeah, so it, it's a huge factor. We go through and we cost everything that we're doing. Um, we're trying to check what the kind of ingredients costs are as we're going along, because that varies hugely, obviously, with depending on who we're working with. But I think our average uh, main course is about 54 pence, which is considerably cheaper than a lot of um, kind of animal product dishes. So, um, yeah, we're, we're constantly kind of, you know, it's a massive driver for people to do this actually even if they don't believe in um, the health benefits and getting the extra fiber and reducing the saturated fat and um, the fact the impact it can have on the climate um, cost is definitely a big 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 factor and one we have to constantly um, bear in mind. Well cool, thank you. Um, Tony um, I know you said that uh, you you perhaps have a, a slightly uh, better budget than the, the many schools but um, cost obviously still um, a big consideration. Uh, you're able to produce the menus uh, that you do uh, at, at, a, at a reasonable cost. The, the ingredients you need, they're, they're not more expensive than the sort of a, a meat alternative? Uh, no, like um, uh, as it's been said uh, on various chats, uh, that using more lentils, pulses, it makes it much, much cheaper and uh, adding vegetables to those uh, you can produce some fantastic meals and uh, it's just persevering with the students to get them to try and keep trying and keep trying like uh, people laugh at me because I have a constant supply of teaspoons on the hot plate for students just to try whatever dish we put on but you you see like um, at one time, students would eat uh, pasta with tomato sauce, straightforward pasta, pomodoro, and they'd love it. Introduce five different pulses to that tomato sauce. And the first reaction is, what is that? But then when they've tasted it and they realize, oh, it tastes virtually the same, but you've got five different beans in it. Mm -hmm and pulses so you're getting all those nutritions going into the food and they're loving it but at the same time it's reducing your costs because you're not having to put meat into it and uh, like some of the recipes that i've been tweeting out uh, this week uh, cost like 27 pence to produce a portion so it's a case of you know, putting your head down, working hard, producing stuff that you know will work if you persevere and 
work with the students. Uh, that the hardest thing is getting people to try something new. So going out into the dining room, giving samples out, uh, going into the classrooms, giving samples out. It's all ways of encouraging students to try something new. So if they've tried it, when they come to the hot plate and they see it, you have more chance of winning them over to accept it. Okay, that's, that's lovely. A uh, very inspirational note on which to end because uh, unfortunately we've, we've run out of time. So um, my thanks to um, Richard, Colette, Musa, Tony and Claire and to you for joining us. Um, as we uh, finish up the, today's webinar, you'll see a, a number of side slides coming up um, with the logos of the sponsors who have supported Plant Based Week and we thank them very much. Um, a special mention too to the Vegetarian Society and its own National Vegetarian Week, which is running now and finishes on Sunday. And uh, in addition, it's it's worth mentioning that we've pulled together quite a lot of um, useful content um, on our plant based plant based week web page, um, including some cooking demos, resources you can use to promote plant based dishes, as well as articles and stories highlighting some of the best practice that is happening across the public sector. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, that's all for us. Thank you once again to our panellists. Uh, thank you and goodbye.